Good morning. Can you hear me? Is the mic on? Good morning. My name is Claudia Berry, and I chair the monthly program committee. So I am here to welcome all of you and love to see this crowd out here. It's starting to grow. Glad that many of you are feeling more comfortable and coming out. I know that we have people who are also viewing our, the presentation that is being live streamed. The beauty of you being here in person is that at the end of President Scogan's talk, you will get to ask questions and we will bring the microphones to you. You don't even have to come down the aisle anymore. We are starting to see a little breakthrough in the COVID regulations. So I just want to remind you before I introduce our president for HASP to turn off all of these. We certainly would not want someone calling, buzzing, or ringing you during any of the presentations, and particularly President Scogan's presentation. He is on a tight schedule, but he said that if we end at 10.35, he will be able to take some questions from us. So keep that in mind. And without further ado, let me introduce the president of Haas, Barb Stenny. Thank you and good morning, HASP members. I am Barbara Stedjink, president of HASP, for just a few more months. It's wonderful to see so many of you here this morning. As Claudia said, the crowd is growing um, and we'll hope that next month we'll even have more. So welcome to those of you who are here in person and also to those of you who are streaming our program this morning. On behalf of the Haas Board and membership, I want to give a special welcome to our speaker of this morning, President of Hope College, Matt Skogan. President Skogan, I believe that you were with us in November of 2019, and it was at that time that you told us about your goal to make a Hope College education accessible to all prospective students by removing tuition as a high cost barrier. That goal is now underway as part of the impressive initiative called Hope Forward. We are looking forward to hearing your update about this innovative program. Scott Travis, Executive Director of Alumni Engagement at Hope College is also with us this morning. Many of us are familiar with Scott, who has been sitting on our board since the alignment of HASP and HOPE, which took place in 2016. He is very supportive of HASP and has continued to see us through challenging times. Scott is basically the link between HASP and HOPE College, and we appreciate all the contributions he has made to our organization. Scott will be introducing President Skogan shortly. Also this morning, I want to give a very warm welcome to our new office and project manager, Tricia Cabana. Hopefully, many of you have been able to meet her at the office or this morning out in the foyer before the meeting. If not, please say hello to her afterwards. Would you mind standing, Tricia, and just Turn around, so great. Thank you, that's our warm, warm Hess welcome. And uh, please help her become acquainted with you by wearing your name tag. That will really help her. You know, there's several of us and only one of her. Also staff related, you recently received a constant contact from Kim announcing our good news that David Olgers will be joining HASP as an interim staff member for tech support. He officially begins the week of April 18th, but you might see him around in the classroom the next week or so, as he's going to help cover some hybrid courses. Please inter introduce yourself to David and welcome to him to our HASP classroom. 
There's just a couple of announcements I want to give you this morning. Please refer to the April newsletter for news about from the, from the curriculum committee and opportunities for service and information regarding the upcoming special events. Coming soon on April 26 is the bus tour of three Ottawa County parks. If you think you would like to go, you need to sign up right now. So please do so immediately. Uh, also, I think uh, I was supposed to make a little announcement for anybody interested in the small interest group of hikers. That group is meeting outside in the foyer after today's meeting. So if you're interested, please join that group. So once again, thank you so much for being with us this morning, both in person and virtually. Uh, Doug Walvard, membership chairperson, will now introduce our guests and new members. Thank you, Barb. Well, we're very pleased to have four guests with us this morning, and I would like to recognize them by name. Uh, Sally and Fred Froberg, and Donna and Dave Hupe. Hupe? Hupe, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But, uh, but we're really so glad you're with us this morning, and uh, just hope that you'll get to know more about all the great things that HASP has to offer you, and we would really love to have you come on board and join us. Also, it's my pleasure to welcome, introduce eight new members this morning. And the traditional thing is to have them stand and face you, but this is difficult when some of them are at home virtually on the sofa and you can't tell whether they are standing or not. So I will uh, introduce them anyway. And if by any chance some of you new members got in here past our welcome desk, stand up as I say your name. But anyway, Janet Ch Chichester and her husband Wayne Riley are joining us. Marsha Manning and her husband Robert Parrish are joining us. Janet and James Shottle are out of the country and will be introduced at a subsequent meeting. Uh, Scott Essenberg, I know, is uh, present virtually. And last but not least, Jerry Colvin, please stand up. Turn around and... Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Thanks to Jody, his wife, who brought him in. So actually, we've got four married couples joining us this morning. That's pretty good. So thank you for welcoming them. Uh, my usual spiel, if you know someone who you're sure would love HASP and all that HASP offers, talk to them about it, invite them to a monthly meeting. We'd love to have them here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug, Barb, and Claudia. Um, as Barb mentioned, my name is Scott Travis, and I have the pleasure of working with HASP. It's so nice to see familiar faces. In a music building, I feel a little bit right now like the opening act in a concert where you're kind of like, I don't really know who this person is. It sounds kind of cool, but when's the main act start? So that's my job. It's pretty easy this morning. I get to say nice things about our monthly program speaker and about HASP. Uh, to do this, join me and think back to the days before COVID-19 was in our collective consciousness and everyday vocabulary. 180 days before, in fact. The day was September 13th. 2019, and a 39-year-old Hope and Harvard graduate from New York was inaugurated as Hope College's 14th president. In his inauguration speech, he shared how he inherited a generational love of learning from his parents. He sh shared how they exuded a passion for learning in the pursuit of wisdom and truth, a passion he carried in his return to Hope College. He also drew inspiration from Isaiah 43 with excitement for a new thing, springing up for us to perceive as God makes a way through the wilderness. Wait a second. Generational love of learning, excitement for new things, wisdom and inspiration, perseverance on difficult paths. This guy sounds like a Hass member. <laughs> the parallels between today's monthly speaker and Hasp go even deeper. In the same speech, he outlined three major areas where Hope College can chart a course of leadership. The future of learning, the future of work, and the future business model of higher education, 
of which you'll hear more about shortly. But first I wanted to point out these three parallels. The future business model. HASP's business model is built on strong financial stewardship. You are self-sufficient, investing surpluses from operations back into the organization, and in the process, generous, generously funding at least two endowed scholarships. Second, future of work. At first glance, this area might not be as relevant as in the narrowest sense you've left work behind. However, on closer examination, we find this not to be true at all. You are, after all, called the Hope Academy of Senior Professionals, not the Hope Academy of Retired Amateurs. I see you every day taking your expertise and your wisdom and sharing it within your industries and with HOPE students and with others in the community. Finally, the future of learning. You are on the forefront of exploring hybrid learning environments, recognizing well, while there is irreplaceable power in face-to-face -face classrooms, online options increase accessibility for those who need it. Uh, today and how you've been doing monthly programs in your classes is a great example of that. And finally, there's one last similarity between you and today's monthly speaker. Each of you, in some way or another, have taken a journey to and from hope and now back again. And for that, I am thankful. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 14th president of Hope College, a fellow HASP wannabe, and our monthly program speaker, President Matthew Skogan. Hey, good morning, everybody. I, uh, I am indeed a HASP wannabe, so it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being part of HASP. Uh, if you followed HOPE, you know we've won some sport championships recently, and there's been a lot of talk about the super seniors, these seniors who came back because of an extra year of eligibility during COVID. And for all the talk about super seniors at HOPE, I think of HASP. I think of you as our true super seniors. So uh, thank you for, for being part of HASP. Thank you for having me. Uh, if you remember, this was supposed to happen. I was supposed to be with you a couple of months ago, but Omicron ripped through our family. It started with our two girls who are in middle school, and then I got it, and then my son got it. My wife, my wife Sarah, we don't think she ever got it. She never tested positive, at least. But anyway, we're, we're all good now, and, uh, and so uh, it's, it's, it's good to be with you. I will do my best to make this worth the wait. Um, I'm going to talk, as you, as you heard, I'm going to talk mostly this morning about our Hope Forward vision, and I'm going to set that up a little bit and then talk about how it's going so far. And then at the end, I'm going to, just, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Hope College in general and share some updates on Hope and how we're doing as a, as a campus community. Um, so that's kind of, a, that's kind of the plan for, for this morning. Uh, before I jump in, uh, I know there's been some new folks who've joined HASP since I was last with you almost two and a half years ago. It feels crazy. I mean, the whole world is such a different place than it was two and a half years ago. So a lot has happened. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, as Scott just said, my name is Matt Skogan. I have the, uh, the honor and the joy of being HOPE's 14th president. I'm uh, almost done with my third year as president. Uh, but to borrow a line from the Hair Club for Men commercials, if you remember those in the 1980s, uh, I'm not just the president of Hope, I'm also a client. Uh, or in my case, I'm a graduate, at least. I graduated from Hope uh, 20 years ago in 2002. This is me with, uh, with my parents and my, my, my siblings. Uh, like so many people in this room, going to Hope College changed my life. It transformed me, it put my career on a trajectory that it would not have been otherwise. And as I reflect back on that, and, and one thing that I've realized later is just how difficult it was for my parents, who both had a deep appreciation for, uh, for, for higher learning. Uh, both my parents went not just to college, but also to graduate school. Uh, my mom had a master's, my dad had a PhD. So I grew up in this environment where uh, I was probably expected to go to college, but for me that was okay because I was excited to come to college. Uh, but what I realized later is just how difficult it was for my family, a pretty uh, modest middle-class family in Portage, Michigan, uh, how difficult it was for my family to afford uh, sending me to Hope. My mom was a middle school science teacher. My dad worked at a chemist at a local pharmaceutical company. I found out later in life that my parents had to take on a second mortgage in their home to send me to Hope, and of course they had not just me to worry about, but my, uh, my three younger siblings. Uh, that was 20 years ago when the tuition of Hope 
uh, was uh, uh, tuition, room, and board. The, the whole thing combined was around $20,000. Uh, today, of course, it's more than double that, which means that uh, while it was difficult for me 20 years ago, uh, m many people, most people, I would say, have, uh, have an ev even more difficult time finding their way to make Hope College affordable and accessible. Um, I want to briefly put this price increase in context for you, because we all expect prices to increase over time. Um, that's called inflation. <laughs> A lot of people are talking about inflation right now. Um, if you consider um, other, other uh, price increases, uh, just to put the, the cost of college in context, so from 1979, that's the year I was born, 1979 to today, the price of a gallon of milk has gone up by roughly 266%. Uh, average wages, again, year I was born to today, average wages in the United States have gone up by 223%. But look at what's happened to the sticker price of tuition in college. Uh, over the course of my lifetime, uh, the sticker price of tuition, sorry, there's an arrow in a weird place there, but the sticker price of tuition has gone up by 907%. So one way to think about that is even after adjusting for the average increase in wages over uh, my lifetime, the price of college today is still four times more difficult for families to afford. Four times more difficult to afford today than it was uh, 43 years ago when I was born. Now, a lot of people, when you point out statistics like this, there's always critics, there's always naysayers, there's always people who, who try to poke holes in this. Um, this is one example. This is from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and don't worry, you don't have to read this paper. Um, I've read it for you. And essentially what this paper says is, the paper says, yes, the sticker price of tuition has gone up, but so too have financial aid packages. Scholarships have also gone up, and so we should all just calm down, and we should stop freaking out about this. But for me, it's kind of hard to calm down when I think about what's happened to student debt in this country. So today, uh, collectively, Americans owe $1.7 trillion of student debt. If that were the GDP of a country, that would be the ninth largest economy in the world. Just wrap your heads around that for a second. $1.7 trillion of student loan debt owed by Americans. The average amount of debt that a college graduate uh, graduates with today is almost $48,000, and that number increases every year. So it kind of seems out of control for me, and therefore it's hard for me to calm down, despite the things that, uh, for example, the, the St. Louis, St. Louis Fed says. Uh, the question is, how in the world did we get here? Because it, like it seems like it's a little bit out of control, perhaps a lot of bit out of control. The question is, how did we get here? And what I want to postulate to you this morning is that the price of tuition has increased, that this trajectory has happened not because it needed to, but because it could. In other words, what I want to say to you is that uh, the, the price has gone up because there's no natural incentive in higher education to keep the price of tuition lower. And there's a lot of things we can point to. There's a lot of ways we can frame this. I want to just briefly show you two things that I think help illustrate this. The first has to do with student loans themselves. So student loans date back to 1944. Student loan programs were initiated under the premise of making college more accessible and ultimately making the American dream more available. Like, that sounds great. All in favor of that, raise your hand. That sounds amazing. Let's do that. But call it the law of unintended consequences because as access to loans went up, so too did the price. And it makes sense. It makes sense because without a limit on the amount of money that students could borrow, colleges could raise their price and just direct students to student loan programs to make up the difference, regardless of how much that difference became. So in a, in a counterintuitive way, access to student loans, while it was intended to give access to higher education, ultimately, in my view, contributed to this uh, crazy price increase that we've seen over the last four decades. Another thing that helps explain uh, the, the this trajectory of tuition increases has to do with how we, and nearly every other college and university in this country, how we fund scholarships. So for a couple of minutes, I want to take you to a, an Economics 101 class. Uh, let's imagine for a second that this is the demand curve uh, for Hope College, the demand curve for attending Hope. We've got the number of students on the bottom axis, the price of tui tuition on the vertical axis. Uh, the, uh, let's say the, the market price, the break-even price of attending Hope College is around $20,000. That's the average price that students pay to come to Hope. So let's call that the, if, if, if we want a class of 800 students, which we do, uh, the market break-even price is around $20,000. But, you, so you might ask yourself, well, why don't we just do that? Why don't we set the price at $20,000 instead of $37,000? Well, 
there's two problems with the $20,000 price point. One is that there are some families who are actually willing and able to pay a whole lot more to come to Hope College, and that's the top triangle you see there. Another problem is that there are a lot of students who we want to have come to Hope, but they can't afford the $20,000 price point, and that's the bottom triangle you see there. So what we do, and what nearly every other college and university does in the United States, is we set our price at the very top of the demand curve, and we know our price is at the top of the demand curve because only 7% of our students pay the full sticker price. And what it means then is that anybody who's paying more than $20,000 to come to Hope College, you're actually paying for your own education and you're subsidizing scholarships for somebody else. So we're running a Robin Hood scheme here. We're running a redistribution scheme. We're running a scheme where we're funding scholarships on a pay-as-you-go basis where some students out there are paying for their own education and they're paying for scholarships for other students. And you can put aside ethical questions about how you feel about this. It's charging different people different prices for the same outcome. Um, by the way, I, I was in New York City last week presenting uh, at a conference with, with uh, some uh, other college presidents on Hope Forward. And I presented this premise uh, as a problem. And what was fascinating, there were, there were several Ivy League college presidents in the room. One Ivy League college president, and I'll leave him unnamed, but one Ivy League college president uh, raised his hand and he said, you bet this is what we're doing. This is exactly what we're doing. And he said, we view tuition at our institution as a way to, quote, gouge the rich. And I was floored by it. It was this moment of sort of biting honesty where he said, you bet this is what we're doing, and we're doing this intentionally to sort of do this forced redistribution model. And what's fascinating about that is this is an institution with a multi-billion dollar endowment. So if they truly cared about just access to low income, they would actually say, we're not even going to let rich kids come to this institution. We're only going to let low-income students come to this institution. But they're not. They're not. Because why? Because they're addicted to the revenue stream. They're addicted to the revenue stream that these rich kids are paying to come to this institution. So this is what's happening in higher education today. And in an interesting way, I feel like what Hope is, is doing is in some sense sort of exposing some of the... Um, let's call it some of the dark underbelly of, uh, of what's happening in higher education, where uh, there are some places that actually could afford to not do this model, this, this Robin Hood model, but they're not doing it. And I would postulate they're not doing it because they, they like the money. They're addicted to the, to the tuition revenue. So uh, the world needs hope. I think this is a problem. We all, we all agree this problem exists. Uh, the fascinating thing when you step back and think about it, there, there are 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States. There are very few places that are doing anything really creative or really interesting to try to go after this. Uh, the, the question there is why, and that's a longer conversation, probably a whole different HASP presentation. Um, I, I think uh, one thing I've, I've, I've learned as I've been talking about this to a number of different groups, I think there's a sense in which it's sort of like meritocracy gone off the rails. And I believe in meritocracy, but there's almost this sense in higher education where too many people say, yes, we know access to higher education um, is not available to everybody, but in the end, it must be the case that those who, quote, deserve access to higher education are the ones who are finding their way to it. And of course, as a Christian institution, like we just cannot agree with that. As Christians, we say no one deserves a good life. Everything we have is an unmerited favor to us from God. So in an interesting way, I feel like we're not just exposing some of the problems with the business model of higher education. I feel like we're, we're in part also exposing uh, to, like meritocracy sort of gone off the rails, uh, in, at least in higher education, perhaps in, perhaps in a broader sense. Uh, the, the world needs hope. There are so many, this is what I like to say, because as you, as you, maybe you agree with me on this, maybe you don't. As I step back and think about our country right now, obviously we're having all kinds of conversations, all kinds of questions are on the table, uh, income inequality, uh, racial injustice, all kinds of big, big questions are on the table right now. I actually think there's one big question that is underneath all those questions. And to me, the big question that we're really wrestling with in this country right now is something like this. Are we indeed going to be a land of opportunity for all, or are we going to be a land of privilege for a few? And my take is actually that the answer to that question is going to be decided not just in the political sphere, but actually through the financial aid and admissions processes on the college campuses across this country. Because there's remarkable research now that shows that college can and should be the great equalizer. There's an economist at Harvard named Raj Chetty, and he has a stunning research on this. And he shows that if a low-income student and a high-income student go to the same college, they have remarkably similar opportunities for success after they graduate. It means that college is a great equalizer. It means that higher education holds the key to solving income inequality. But of course, what we're seeing is that when we look at our country, low-income students and high-income students in general are not going to the same colleges. And that's a problem. And that's in part one of the problems we're, we're trying to solve. 
So the solution that we put forward is this, this, this uh, bold idea uh, called Hope Forward. Let me briefly describe how it works and then uh, describe some of what we've learned since we publicly launched this uh, last July. Uh, we call it Hope Forward uh, because it's essentially a pay it forward vision for funding one's college education. Uh, I like to say there are two ways that people pay for college today. One is pay as you go, where you pay your college or university uh, a tuition bill at the start of every semester, and you're paying as you go through. The second is pay it back, where you're actually paying a bank or a lender after you graduate. And of course, most people pay through some combination of the two, pay as you go and pay it back. What we're talking about is something entirely different. It's a pay it forward model, a model that's, that's funded through gifts, that's funded through giving and generosity. And so the way we envision this working is that students would come to Hope. Uh, they wouldn't pay any tuition upfront. Their tuition rather would be funded by the generosity of others. They then make a commitment. They make a commitment to give something to Hope every year after they graduate. And we don't, people always ask, well, do you put an amount on that? Do you specify a percentage of income? No, we don't. Because we want it to be a gift. We want it to be a true gift that's given out of generosity. And as soon as we say, uh, you commit to giving a gift and we suggest this amount, well, then it no longer feels like a gift. It feels like paying a bill. And what we're trying to do is move away from bill paying to gift giving as the way we fund Hope College. One way you could think about this uh, is that once we reach this, this destination, it would sort of be like a crowdfunded model so that our alumni would be crowdfunding our current students. It's a community that's taking care of itself. And by the way, when you read the book of Acts, like this is what, exactly what the Bible talks about when it talks about a Christian community, a community that's taking care of itself. So uh, in, in modern terms, we think of it sort of that way. It's like a crowdfunded model. Um, that's the way we envision this working. It's going to take a, a while to build to that because you, you imagine we're on a tuition-based system today. We need $55 million of tuition revenue every single year to make the budget work. And so to move from a tuition-based system to this gift-based system uh, is a complicated transition, to say the least. Um, we could do, one way to do it would be to have uh, cohorts of students on a Hope Forward model and slowly build that cohort over time so that eventually you have a full alumni base uh, paying, paying you gifts. And the math there can work, it just takes a long time. Uh, today we have nearly 40,000 uh, Hope College alumni around the world. If each of them, uh, well let's say two-thirds, let's say we're going to have some free riders, let's say two-thirds of our alumni gave on average about $2,000 a year. If that were to happen, we'd be done. That's, uh, that's about $55 million of revenue, so we wouldn't need to charge tuition if we had roughly two-thirds of our alumni giving $2,000 every year. Uh, to build to that kind of culture where we have that amount of alumni giving that kind of money is going to take some time. So uh, what we're, and the way we've modeled that is we could get there, but it probably would take four to five decades. So what we're trying to do is, through a pretty aggressive endowment fundraising campaign, accelerate that transition. And what we've embarked on is a pretty daunting, uh, but I have to say exciting, uh, uh, endeavor to try to raise a billion dollars in our endowment so that it won't take four to five decades to make that transition from a tuition-based system to a gift-based system, but rather we think if we can raise that money over the next 10 to 15 years, we can flip a switch. And, uh, and get to the, to the Hope Forward system uh, much quicker. So that's what we're trying to build towards. Uh, while, we're, uh, while we've embarked on this big uh, fundraising campaign, we've decided to go ahead and get started so that we can learn and assess and, and course correct along the way if we need to. So we have a, a cohort of about 20 students on campus right now, they're all freshmen, who are uh, uh, living into the Hope Forward model. Uh, they are not paying tuition, rather they've signed a commitment, we call it a covenant, to give back to Hope uh, every year after they graduate. And they put their fingerprints on it, there's a big version of it that's hanging on the wall, and then they have their own copy of it. Uh, so there's 20 students, live, uh, Hope, 20 Hope Forward students in one cohort right now. Next year we're going to have a second cohort, roughly uh, double that size. And what's fascinating is, so you know, we're, we're uh, less than a year into this, but we've already learned a lot. And I want to briefly describe some of what we've learned through this experiment so far, and then talk about how we're doing from a fundraising campaign, and then we can, we can uh, lead into a conversation. Um, the, the first thing, so the question is, what does this solve? What are the effects of a Hope Forward model? The first one is sort of the obvious one, but sometimes it's worth pointing out the obvious. It solves the problem of access and affordability in a very radical way. And if you look just at the, uh, at the demographics of this, uh, this, this cohort of 20 students, it's radically more diverse than our, than our campus population in every way we would measure that. Uh, racial diversity, it's 50% non-white. Uh, geographic diversity, it's 30% international. And it's uh, radically more socioeconomically diverse than our, than our campus is today. So uh, we feel like just, ju just, you know, just from that perspective and just from a small cohort of 20 students, we feel like, wow, this has actually moved the needle 
uh, further and much quicker than we anticipated. Here's what's fascinating about that is, you know, we, like every other place, have been spending millions of dollars every year on uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives and, and recruiting and all kinds of things to make our campus more diverse. And that's great. We need to keep doing that. But with this cohort, the only thing we did, the only thing we did was change the way these students pay for college. They're still paying for it. They're just paying for it through gifts after they graduate rather than tuition bills before they, before, before they get their education. And it radically moved the needle, dramatically moved the needle in every way we would measure uh, diversity, in every way we would measure access. So uh, that's the first thing that we've learned is that this is, is working. And to be honest, I think it's working actually even better than, than I would have, would have anticipated. Um, a second thing that uh, Hope Forward does, and I, I think it's sort of interesting, is it aligns incentives, uh, I think, in a pretty compelling way. So if you, um, if you think about what happens when we replace uh, uh, bill paying with gift giving, uh, one thing that happens is that we as an institution have skin in the game I think that we don't necessarily have today. Because uh, under a Hope Forward model, we as an institution become highly incentivized to help our students be successful after they graduate. Why? Because the more successful they are after they graduate, the more opportunities they have to be generous. So instead of uh, this you know, kind of relationship where we hand them a diploma and they go off with their lives, which doesn't really happen, but sometimes it kind of does, uh, with a Hope Forward model, we actually uh, have this burden of we want to help make our students successful. We have that incentive. Today, what happens is it's parents and it's students who are continually asking the question, what's the ROI? What's the return on investment on this extraordinary amount of money that I'm paying you up front? Under a Hope Forward model, that burden shifts to us. We're the ones, the institution, we're the ones that have to make the education so good that our students are grateful for it after they graduate. So I like the alignment of incentives. Obviously, as you know, I'm, part of my academic training is as an economist, so I like alignment of incentives, and I think with this Hope Forward model, incentives are aligned in a really interesting and compelling way. Uh, another thing that, that this Hope Forward model does, uh, obviously, we've talked, about, uh, we've talked about this mindset of giving, but I, I want you to just stop and think for a, a minute about what it will mean to have an alumni base, thousands of people who've committed to being givers. And I, obviously, they've committed to give to hope, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful that they're, they're going to uh, be givers in, in a broad sense. They're going to be generous citizens of the world. So these Hope Forward students, uh, there's 22 of them on our campus. Uh, they've only completed one semester of college. They're you know, two-thirds of the way through their second semester. They're already asking questions like, uh, we were with them for, my wife and I were with them for dinner a few weeks ago, and one of the students asked the question, we've committed to a lifetime of generosity. How would you uh, advise us to start budgeting for that now? These are 18-year-olds, and they're asking questions about how do we budget for a lifetime of giving. That's a stunning <laughs> uh, mindset shift to the way the world thinks. Most of the world out there thinks, what can I take from this world to make my life better? And what we're hoping to graduate with these Hope Forward students is students who look at the world and say, what can I give? What can I give to make this world a better place? To paraphrase JFK, not what can I take from the world, but what can I give to make this world a better place? So that's going to make the world a better place. In an interesting way, it's also going to make their lives better. And there's a whole body now of scientific research that shows giving and generosity has all kinds of benefits to one's health and one's happiness. Uh, during the pandemic, there's a, a, a class at Yale, one of, the most, one of the most popular classes at Yale is a class taught by a woman named Lori Santos. It's called The Science of Well-Being. And you may have heard of the class because uh, Yale put it online for free during the pandemic and three million people took the course. According to Santos, there are three things that contribute to a life of happiness. The first is giving, the second is helping others, and the third is getting sleep. <laughs> So like all three of those things are things we all know we should be doing, but most of us don't do those things, at least to the degree we should be doing them. Uh, for college students, maybe that sleep thing is kind of a lost cause. But the other two, giving and helping others, with Hope Forward, we can structurally bake that in. We can structurally bake that into the system. And we're excited about what that's going to mean, not just for the world. We're excited about what that's going to mean for the health and the happiness of our graduates. Because there's, as, as I said, there's lots of research that now shows that's the case. Another thing that we've, uh, we, we've thought about a lot, and we're starting to see this with the, um, with the Hope Forward students, is the, the idea of shifting away from a relationship with students that too often feels transactional to more of this community mindset. I talked about the idea of a community that's taking care of itself. That's a totally different kind of relationship with students than a transactional relationship, than a relationship with students that too often uh, feels like a consumer sort of relationship. 
I came from, before the job, I worked in the business world for 11 years. I think in the business world, the, the customer relationship works reasonably well. I actually think for a healthy learning environment, it's toxic. It's toxic to have a consumer mindset uh, to, uh, be, between institutions like ours and our students. Um, uh, the, the question is, like, what's a customer? A customer is someone with dollars in their hands looking to buy something. And to the extent students have become customers, the interesting question is, what do students actually think they're buying? Are they buying a degree? Are they buying a job? Are they buying a career? Are they buying grades? And there's uh, some really interesting research now that shows, so if you look at the trajectory of grade inflation, this shows the percentage of students with an A over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, and it goes from roughly 15% of students getting an A to today nearly 50% of students getting an A. And I think there's probably a lot of things that contribute to this trajectory. But I also think it's probably not a coincidence that this trajectory roughly parallels the tuition trajectory. Because as tuition has gone up, students have increasingly uh, become customers. And again, the question is, what do they think they're buying with their money? And the incentive structure is such, and I'm not saying that colleges are doing this nefariously, but the incentive structure is such that if students, are, you know the old adage, your customer's always right. If students think they're buying grades, the incentive structure is such that colleges and universities are kind of incentivized to give students the grades they want in order to keep the revenue flowing. I can't tell you um, how often I hear students or parents appealing to their tuition bill to try to get what they want. Students will say things like, and I heard this all the time during COVID, from all, spec all sides of the spectrum. Students would say, I'm paying you X thousand dollars a year, so I therefore uh, deserve to have your COVID policies aligned to my preferences. Or parents might say something like, I'm paying you the full sticker price, so therefore my son or daughter uh, ought to have the best living arrangement you have on campus. What's happened is that as tuition has gone up, students have become increasingly customers or consumers, and that has actually led to this sense of entitlement. And what we're seeing in higher education right now is this crazy arms race where, uh, where places are competing for students through amenities, through lazy rivers and luxury dining halls and luxury living arrangements. And all those things are great. It sounds like an amazing vacation, but they're totally ancillary to what the point of college ought to be, which is education. So the price of tuition is leading to a customer mindset. That customer mindset is actually leading to a sense of entitlement. It just is, and I see it on our campus, unfortunately, but, but it's, it's the case not here, it's the case everywhere, all throughout higher education. And what, we're, what, I th what I'm convinced we're gonna see with Hope Forward is an like, overnight just breakdown of that kind of mindset because we're moving away from this, uh, this kind of relationship to something that's more of a community taking care of itself. Um, this one I think is, is especially interesting for this group. Um, the, the, the opportunities that having an alumni base that's connected to us for their entire lifetime uh, that is just ripe with opportunity around lifelong learning. Uh, and by definition, when students come to HOPE under a HOPE Forward model, they are by definition committing to have a lifelong relationship with our institution. So instead of just signing up for a four-year degree, they're signing up to be engaged with HOPE for their entire lifetime, because they're signing up before they come, they're signing up to, have, to, to give to HOPE, to, to give to HOPE, to be committed to this institution and to this institution's success. So having an alumni base that is that connected to us over the course of their lifetime, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about all the opportunities that will, um, that will make available to us around lifelong learning. And one thing we've thought about, uh, another way to think about Hope Forward is moving from a sort of, uh, in, a, in a business term sense, moving from a pay for service model to a subscription model. And Hope Forward students, again, are by definition signing up to be subscribed to Hope for their entire lifetime. And we can think about different levels of subscription. So if you give X, you know, if you get X amount, you get one free course online a year for the rest of your life, or things like that. We can think about different levels of subscription uh, coming along with different levels of giving. And I, I think it's cool. I, I think it's, it's, it's gonna be exciting to have an alumni base that's that connected with us, and I also think it's gonna be exciting just the, the educational opportunities it will afford both us and our, and our alumni. Um, another thing, and uh, again, we've, we've already started to observe some of this in our, in our 20 students, the, the idea of, of skin in the game, and this is a really interesting one, um, the, the most common point of criticism, the most, common, the most common critique I get of Hope Forward is people say, this will never work because students won't feel skin in the game. They'll say, this, this sounds a lot like free tuition, they won't appreciate their education because they're not paying for it up front. Well, <laughs> Uh, my best retort to that is, first of all, it's not free tuition because students have committed to give after they graduate. And that commitment is a very real commitment. It's a very personal commitment because, here's the difference, they've committed to give their own money. And the price of tuition is so high right now that very few students can afford to pay it themselves. For the most part, it's parents paying tuition or someone else. 
And that's a classic principal agent problem where it, 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 students aren't paying for their own education. So actually today, students don't have skin in the game. Uh, there's a woman at UC Merced named Laura Hamilton, and she's done research on this. And her research shows this fascinating uh, negative correlation between parental contribution to one's college education and grades. So basically what she shows is that the more your parents pay for your college, the lower your grades are. And she wrote a book about her research. Her book is called Paying for the Party. And it's basically saying that to the extent students are goofing off in college, they're goofing off in college because they don't feel skin in the game, because someone else is paying for it. And with Hope Forward, students are, students are committing their own money. Again, they're committing their own hard-earned money to give it to Hope after they graduate. So I'm convinced that actually there will be more skin in the game from a student perspective with the Hope Forward model than there is under a tuition-based model, and that that will translate to students feeling the weight of that commitment they've made and actually taking their education more seriously, uh, not less seriously. And then the, the, the final thing I, I want, want to point out here is the, the idea of, uh, of impact. And one thing we talk a lot about, especially when we, when we look at what's happening with student debt, uh, we see student debt skewing the kind of things that students do after they graduate. And I hear this anecdotally from students all the time. Uh, I'll go into the dining hall, and my, my rhythm, if I'm, if I'm not traveling, my rhythm is to uh, just uh, go into Phelps or Cook, one of our dining halls, for three or four meals a week, and I'll just plot myself down with students. And um, in my head, I think they're probably enjoying this, but I'm probably ruining their, <laughs> I'm probably ruining their meal because they... <laughs> All of a sudden, they have to sit with me. And I, I have a pretty, I, I, have a, I have three questions that I ask uh, every student at the table. And one of the questions I always ask is, what do you want to do after you graduate? And one of the common responses, I'll get some flavor of this response, where students will say, what I want to do is different than what I feel like I have to do. And what I want to do is some ministry. What I want to do is Doctors Without Borders or the Peace Corps or Teach for America. But what I have to do because I have $40,000 of student debt is become a consultant or an accountant. No offense to consultants or accountants. But I have to do something to chase income to pay off my debt rather than pursue impact. And what Hope Forward will allow our students to do is to truly chase whatever they feel called to chase, to truly chase the kind of impact they feel called to have. And these are just some quotes from our current Hope Forward students of the kind of things that they want to pursue uh, after they graduate. And it's, it's stunning. Again, these are freshmen. These are 18-year-olds. Uh, and they're talking about uh, tackling racial inequality in our healthcare system. They're talking about leveraging social media to discuss mental health. They're talking about suicide prevention in high schools, supporting emotional well-being of students in foster care, breaking the school-to-prison pipeline for inner city kids and reducing homelessness through affordable housing. So it, uh, not everybody's gonna pursue those kind of things, but a lot of students at Hope, because we're a mission-driven institution, a lot of students want to pursue those kind of things, but be, the, debt burden feels, the debt burden skews them to do other things. So uh, Hope Forward will allow our students to pursue uh, true impact. Um, uh, one thing I, I love to point out here, uh, and Scott referenced uh, doing new things. This is, in some ways, a new idea. I was talking to a reporter um, who co has covered higher education for 20 years uh, last week, and he said, in my 20 years of covering higher education, I've never heard of an idea like this. So yes, on one hand, it's a new thing. On the other hand, at least for hope, this is an old thing. This is, a th this is something that's been in our DNA uh, from the very beginning. And I want to take you all the way back to 1866. So this is our... Um, this is our very first, uh, I guess this is our very first, uh, 1866 was the year we were founded, but that was actually the year of our first graduating students, so maybe it's possible there was a, a course catalog before this, but this was the first one we could find, this is 1866, and um, you don't need to read this whole thing, but notice there at the top, it says uh, the price of tuition is $12 per term, so they posted a price of tuition. By the way, um, 1866, you know what Harvard was charging for tuition? 107 dollars a year. So uh, uh, we posted a, a, a price of $12, but then the next, the, that rest of that paragraph says, but it's subject to, uh, it, to being offset through benevolent contributions. And then at the very end, I love this, uh, this uh, sentence at the very end under uh, beneficiary help, it says, no youth desiring of receiving an education, yet not having the means to meet the expense, will be turned from the doors of the institution on that account. But friendly aid can always be found for such as are worthy. So this is 1866, the year Hope was founded. Uh, let's fast forward uh, four decades later. Uh, this is 1907, and here what you can see is the, um, the, the focus has actually, uh, they've actually increased the focus. So they haven't uh, wandered from it, they've actually doubled down on it, 
And here you can see uh, the second part that's highlighted there. It says there are no longer tuition fees. So they've just stopped posting a price. Whereas in the beginning they were saying it's $12, but we're going to offset it through benevolent contributions. Uh, four, four decades later, they're just saying there's, we're not charging tuition here. And, uh, and, and then it says the aim constantly kept in mind is to provide at Hope College everything necessary to a broad liberal education at the lowest possible cost. So. Um, What's interesting here, people always ask me, how unique was this for, for this to be in Hope's history? I don't really know the answer to that because it, 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 um, uh, you sort of have to do individual research on every institution. What I do know is that not everyone was doing this. Um, I don't think we were the only ones doing this. This, this was basically the, the, the church. Church contributions were offsetting uh, tuition. And some places were doing that, but not everyone. So at this point, I said, you know, the year we were founded, Harvard was charging $107. By this point, they were charging well over $200 for tuition. Uh, so, you know, we were doing something somewhat, uh, well, I would say very countercultural at the beginning. Um, it was only about 10 decades, uh, so, sorry, only about a decade later that Hope then started charging tuition, and then we sort of followed the, we followed the culture. We followed the, followed the wave, and our tuition went up roughly in parallel to, to every other institution. And in part, what we're trying to do with Hope Forward is go back. Uh, for the first 54 years of our history, roughly a third of our history, we did not charge tuition. And in part, what we're trying to do is go back to that, but go back to it through a, through a somewhat creative model, through a model that I think is uniquely aligned to our Christian mission. And what's, uh, what's cool, so the Bible talks about money all the time. The Bible basically says the purpose of money is to give it away. Part of what we're saying is let's build the principles of the Bible into our business model. And what's fascinating is, you know, obviously as Christians, we, we ought to spend most of our time thinking about how we apply the Bible to our personal lives. That's the right focus. But even, but Christian institutions, even Christian, Christian institutions, for the most part, they're structurally set up in the same way the world is set up. And part of what we're doing is we're saying, let's actually apply the principles of the Bible to our business model, to our actual structure. And so what we do is we, we look at the, the gospel, and Jesus creates this upside-down economy where he says it's actually the poor and the lowly and the meek who are closest to God. And we say that we think that means Christian educators ought to then be pushing hardest on access and affordability. Uh, Jesus creates this upside down economy where he says it's those who give who will receive blessings. And again, we're saying, can we build our entire business model around that, around what the Bible says, uh, uh, by what the Bible teaches in terms of giving and generosity? And then the overall message, the overall message of the gospel is you are covered. Your sins are covered. Now go and live differently. And that, at the end of the day, is precisely what we want to say to our students. You're covered. You're covered. Your tuition is covered. Now go and live a different kind of life. Live a life of impact. So yes, this is going back to something that's been in our DNA from the beginning. Uh, not just the business model, but it's our mission. It's our Christian mission. And we're, um, dang, I'm just so excited about this for that, for that reason. Um, let me talk a little bit about how we're doing because I said we need to raise a billion dollars and that's a lot of money. That's a, a daunting and a scary amount of money. So let me just give you a, a sense of how we're doing. Um, I'll click through this pretty quick, but this just shows you how we got to the billion dollars. As I said, this, this shows uh, the, what we're projecting. So this is just a glimpse into our financial models. Uh, what we're projecting we will need for tuition revenue over the next decade. As I said earlier, today we need about $55 million of tuition revenue to make the budget work. So if you uh, average out an uh, increase of around 3% a year, just uh, 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 sort of an inflationary growth, and obviously we're probably, I'm not convinced we'll be talking about inflation in a couple of years, by the way. We'll see if I'm right or wrong about that. But I think we'll go back to something more normal and it will settle down. So let's say that 10 years from now we need roughly $70 million of tuition revenue. Um, then the question is, how big of an endowment do we need for the endowment draw to offset that, uh, what we today need for tuition revenue? And then the gifts as they come in, the hope forward gifts as they come in after that will, will help with budget growth from there. Uh, so what we're saying is, t roughly 10 years from now, we'll need an endowment, that's the blue line at the top, we'll need an endowment of roughly $1.5 billion. Uh, today our endowment, uh, there's a little orange dot where our endowment is today, we're just over $300 million. So this is uh, sort of what the trajectory is going to need to look like to get there over the next, over the next 10 years. Um, because uh, uh, our average rate of return, uh, obviously the endowment is invested, it's invested relatively conservatively because we're, we're obviously trying to... Um, to maintain the principle of it. Uh, but nevertheless, we have decent returns in our endowment. The uh, average return of our endowment is 6.5%. Is, uh, uh, we had a great year last year. We had a, a, about a 30% return last year. So obviously we have some years that are higher than that, some years that are lower than that. But the average return is about 6%. Um, we can draw, the, the, the board allows us to draw up to 5.5% off the top of that. Today we're not drawing that much. Today we're drawing about 4.9%. So 
um, w w we have some room to draw more if we wanted to, but I obviously don't want to because we're trying to grow the amount. And then uh, that, that means roughly that over the next uh, 10 years, we need to raise a little over a billion dollars. The, the, the number there uh, with the assumptions we put in is, is $1.14 billion. So this is what we've raised so far. This is uh, what we've raised since, uh, since we publicly launched this, uh, $42 million. This is not all cash in the door. This is, a lot of this is commitments. People have said, I will give you $10 million, I will give you $5 million, and here it will be over some course of time. So this is not all cash in the door, but this is uh, what folks have, uh, have committed to give uh, so far. So we're, you know, $42 million is, is not nothing. That's a lot of money. Um, and uh, on, on the way toward a billion dollars, it feels like, okay, we've got, we've got a ways to go. And we do, but we've got some points on the board. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually excited about the, uh, about the early momentum that we have. Here's just a, a little bit of breakdown of the 42 million. Uh, it's um, it's uh, about 5,000 households uh, have said they're, they're giving to this. Um, about 60% of them are alumni. I actually uh, am encouraged by that. That means 40% of the people who are giving to this are people who are not part of Hope's natural constituency. They're people who are saying, I love what Hope is doing and I want to help. Uh, and so I'm excited, I'm excited about that. Um, you can see uh, the breakdown sort of by group on the right side of the screen, 24 million by uh, parents and friends. So that's uh, basically how we think of non-alumni. Either you're a parent uh, of a student, you are not alumni yourself, but you're a parent, or you're just a friend, just, just somebody who likes what we're doing and you want to help. Uh, and so again, that's a, that's a significant amount to come from non-alumni. 15 million given by alumni and then 4 million by, um, by businesses and, and other organizations. So that's how we're doing so far. Here's just a snapshot of our endowment. Our endowment, uh, this is um, a little bit out of date, but roughly close. It's about $309 million. Uh, if you add to that commitments that are, as I said, not all that 42 million is cash in the door yet. There's about 32 million of it that's yet to be, that we have not yet received yet. So if you add that to it, uh, you know, we're, we're um, a little over $340 million of, of kind of endowment value that we have today. So we've got, we've got a ways to go, but we're, we're, uh, we're getting there. This, in the end, is, is how much we need to raise from where we are today to get to where we, uh, where we need to be. Uh, the question is, how in the world could we do this? Little Hope College raising this, this amount of money. Um, he, this is sort of our, um, again, you can't read all this, but that's fine, because I'll walk you through what, uh, what the key points are. Um, basically, what we're envisioning is... Uh, uh, over the course of, let's say, the next 10 or 15 years, we, we think about half of that amount can come from Hope's natural constituency, and about half will come from outside, uh, outside of Hope's natural constituency. For the half that will come from Hope's uh, natural constituency, we basically envision that happening through two, uh, two five- to seven-year campaigns that will look and feel pretty similar to a traditional campaign that Hope College has done. The last time we did a campaign was Hope for the World. That campaign raised a little over $200 million. So it's, not, it's been a few years since we've been in an official campaign mode. So it's natural to, uh, to, to step up from there. So we think the first, the, the sort of first round of that campaign can be a $250 million campaign over the next five to seven years. Uh, then once, uh, once that is done, then we'll reboot and do another one of, uh, of 350 to 375. So stepping, stepping it up from there. That gets us a little more than halfway there and leaves about 500 million to come from people who uh, may not know Hope today or may not... Um, uh, uh, have, any, uh, ha have any inclination of who we are, but they're excited about what we're trying to do. And one, one thing that, that I've uh, learned, and again, we're pretty early into this, but there's so much pent-up demand for innovation and disruption in higher education that I think that the opportunity we have is to capture hearts and minds of people who say uh, that they, they want to view us as a vehicle for innovation. They want to view us as, a, as an opportunity for disruption. And it, for, for some people, it may not actually be about Hope College per se, but it may be about using us as a vehicle to send a message uh, to higher education uh, saying we, we know something different needs to happen. So that's, uh, uh, again, it's a, long, it's a long journey and a, and a scary journey and a daunting journey, but I'm, I'm excited about it. I've never been more excited about anything that I've worked on in my life than, than this. And then I, I think that, and I'll, I'll close with this. Um, if you, again, if you think about Hope's history, we have a history of doing some pretty um, audacious things. Um, I would say we have a history of doing some, uh, some audacious realism. And I think back to, uh, to, to President Dimnit when he said, I want to build a, a giant chapel. 
uh, that holds 1,500 people, and he decided to build that at, the, at a time when our student body was, was only about 400 people. And it must have seemed totally crazy at the time, not just the money that he needed to raise to build the building, but the mindset of how in the world do you think our college could grow <laughs> by that much? And why would we build something so big for some, a college that's so small? So I think we have, again, going back to our DNA, going back to our history, uh, we have it in our DNA to do big things, to show the world that we're going to do something bold, uh, something that is um, audaciously realistic, and that's, uh, that's, what we're, that's what we're going after with Hope Forward. Uh, let me just give you a few other quick updates, and then I'd love to hear uh, comments, questions, or, or conversation from all of you. Just to give you a sense of how we're doing at Hope, uh, we're doing well. That's the, that's the headline. Things are, things are going well here. It's been a hard couple of years with COVID. I know you know that from your own lives, but it's, uh, that, has not, uh, we, that has not escaped us here at Hope. It's been a hard couple of years. Nevertheless, I think by, by any measure, by any objective measure, Hope College is coming out of the pandemic stronger than we were going into it. And that's amazing. I am uh, grateful for that. We have an amazing team of people here who have allowed us to stay on offense all the way through the pandemic. Uh, our enrollment is very strong. Uh, we, uh, for the first time in a long time, we're full. We, uh, we started this year uh, with no empty beds and no empty seats in the classroom. So we are, we are full from an enrollment perspective. Uh, we're, of course, now uh, um, uh, accepting application, accepting deposits, rather, for next year's freshman class. Uh, as you know, the deadline is May 1, so we'll know a lot more a year from now. But it looks really strong. Uh, right now, we're running about 100 deposits ahead of where we were this time last year. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's a good problem to have. Uh, nevertheless, we'll, uh, we'll, if, if it stays ahead, uh, uh, we'll have some, it will stretch our infrastructure a little bit. So if you drive around town, you'll see that we're, uh, we're putting up three or four new cottages uh, that will be ready for the fall just so that we have some, some, some beds if we, if we need them, and I think we will. So enrollment is good, uh, and um, that's not the case everywhere. And so we feel very, very blessed to be, to be in that situation. Um, our academic programs are, are doing really well, and our academic programs are thriving, and sometimes it's, um, you know, these, uh, uh, sometimes it's, th these don't get pointed out because it's the obvious thing to point out. We're, we're an academic institution, and so sometimes it just kind of goes unsaid, but our academic programs really are thriving. Um, if you look at our, by the way, if you look at our overall ranking, our overall ranking is not great. We're 104 or 5 or something like that, uh, and it's, it's the size of our endowment is one of the main things dragging down our overall ranking, but if you look at our academic rankings, uh, we're uh, in the top 50 uh, nationally for undergraduate teaching, and we're in the top 25 for undergraduate research. We're 24th in the, in the nation for undergraduate research. This year, we just passed Berkeley. So we're just behind Cornell and just ahead of Berkeley. So I, yeah, Little Hope College is, com is competing with the big dogs. We're competing with the best institutions in the world academically. And, um, and that's, that's amazing. We're really the only Christian college that's in that sphere academically. Um, there are other Christian colleges that have higher rankings, but again, there's, there's other things that go into the, the ranking formula than academics. But our academics are, are world-class, truly world-class. We've been able to hire some great uh, professors during the pandemic. Again, we stayed on offense, so a lot of places went on hiring freezes. We didn't. We said we're going to keep hiring, and we were, we were therefore able to recruit some, some scholars that I think probably wouldn't have taken a look at Hope, uh, uh, but they did during the pandemic simply because so many other places had their doors closed. So we feel really good about our academic programs. We're doing some new things in our academics. You may have seen we launched a new global health uh, program uh, just a few months ago. We've got a data analytics program that is up and running, and students are, are, are attracted to that. So we've got some, again, within, a, within an old institution, we're doing some new things, and we're, we're excited about that. Um, athletics, I think you've probably all seen the local headlines, but man, we had a pretty good, a pretty good winner for athletics. Every single sport, uh, every single winter sport uh, won uh, at least the MIAA title. So men's and, and women's swimming and diving, they won their MIAA titles. Uh, men's basketball won the MIAA. Hockey won the national championship for the second year in a row. And then, of course, our, our women's basketball team just won the NCAA uh, national championship. It's amazing. I was there. I, um, we went with our family to the game in Pittsburgh. It was so cool. And the game was, was, was on CBS. So the national exposure for Hope College from that was cool. Um, this team has a Christ-centered mindset at the center of their success. And they have not been shy. And this is just a, a really cool thing. When they're interviewed, they are not shy about talking about, um, about their, their Christian faith as part of their success. 
and um, it, it was just was was one of the one of the highlights of my three years as pr as president was 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 being there for that national championship. It's only happened four times in our history that we've won an NCAA uh, championship. Three times the women's basketball team has won, and and the uh, the volleyball team has won it once. So it's been a it's been a crazy a crazy couple of years. But all things considered, I feel really good. I feel really good about hope, and I'm grateful to all of you for your uh, support and involvement in what we're doing. And uh, with that, I will leave it there. And um, I've got a few minutes for, for Q&A. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Uh, Thank you. I, I am astonished to hear a college president talk so candidly and honestly about what's going on in higher ed. Uh, <laughs> blessings on you. Uh, and I, I was pretty skeptical about just a few headlines I'd seen about mm. Hope Forward, but um, you got your head on straight. I think this is going to work. <laughs> the, the, I, I don't mean this to be a hostile question, but you know, I, I spent a lot of years in a Ivy League institution, and I'm well aware, at least there, that a big part of the uh, skyrocketing tuition is because more and more staff are being added outside the classroom, yeah. which is driving up costs yeah. and more, and of course, the competition for climbing walls and bigger gyms and all that. How is Hope addressing cost containment? Yeah, th thanks. It's a great question. I appreciate your compliment. I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're either onto something here or we're crazy, and I think we're onto something. But it's uh, when I present this in front of other college presidents, it's interesting to get the response. I either get people saying, uh, "This is amazing. I want to do this at my institution." And by the way, there are. I would. This is not competitive. If this were a competitive thing for Hope, like if this was some secret plan for us to increase our yield, I wouldn't be talking about it this publicly. What we're actually trying to do is start a movement, and there. Are, I think there are some places that might actually think about joining us in the movement, and that would be great. There's power in numbers. There are other places that think we're we're exposing uh, some of the some of the things that are that are uh, wrong with the, the business model um, the, the the question about uh, staff increases over academics yeah like I said at the end of the day we exist uh, to educate students that's what our mission says we educate students period for, for lives of leadership and service uh, so that's our mission uh, we exist for for that I, I think um, uh, if you look at our, um, you know, we, we too, like every other place, have seen an increase in staff uh, positions. If you look at us compared to the GLCA, so Great Lakes College Association, uh, we're the, depending on how you call we, uh, you could say we're the second uh, most frugal <laughs> uh, in, terms of, in terms of staff positions. So we're, we're way below the median in terms of, uh, in terms of um, that ratio of, 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 of staff to faculty. Um, but nevertheless, if you look at where cost increases have happened at Hope over the last couple of decades, it's not been on the academic side, it's been on the, the non-academic side. Uh, the three big areas, to be honest, the three big areas where that increase has happened, one is mental health, uh, counseling centers. Um, uh, th that's, that's a need here, that's a need everywhere. The, the, the mental health epide epidemic is real and we need to, be, we need to surround our students uh, with, with the support there. So that's been a real increase at Hope and everywhere. Um, campus safety has been, a, has been an increase here and everywhere, and every time you see, uh, you see one of these tragedies happen at a school, I think uh, a natural response of a lot of places is to say we, we probably need more campus safety. And, and so that's, uh, again, that's a, uh, it's a hard thing to push back on, uh, but that's been a real, a real area of increase. And the third is IT. And, uh, and when you, when you, again, when you look at Hope and when you look at other places, the, the cost of IT is expensive today. It's both the equipment and then the people to support the equipment. And so we're, we're constantly asking the question, how can we, how can we provide a, a, a continue to prov provide a world-class education where we support our students in their journey, uh, but make sure that the bulk of tuition dollars actually goes to pay for education? And, uh, and so that's a, that's a tension. I think, as I said, I think we're doing better than most, but I, th I still think there's probably some areas where we could, where we could do better. Appreciate the question. Am I on? Yes. Uh, I hear just a voice, like, where are you? Oh, there. Over here. <laughs> Thanks. Just before you came on board as yes. president, there was a major implosion of the music department. Yes. And um, other than having a new provost, what have you been able to do to? resolve the uh, meltdown of that situation? 
Yeah, thanks for the question. So as you noted, this happened before I got here. So I, I don't really want to speak to the past, but I'll speak about what we're doing today, which is that we're investing in a world-class music department. We've got a building, uh, you're in it. Uh, so we've got a world-class facility and I want to have a world-class, I want to have world-class people and programs to match the facility. And we're on our way there. I think it's, um, again, for me, it's not really r worth trying to figure out what exactly happened before I got here. Um, I think in, in, uh, in some departments, and music is one of them, where there, there is tension, there's cultural tension, uh, and we see it here where there's tension between, let's call it uh, world music and Western music, between old music and new music. My view is we gotta, we gotta do all of it, all of the above. Uh, we're doing a really great job of that in our dance department. If you go to any of our dance performances, we've got tap dance, we've got ballet, we've got modern dance, we do all of it really well, and that's the vision that we're trying to live into with our music department, where we will do all of it and do all of it uh, in a, in a world-class way. Uh, so yeah, we've got a new provost, we've got some, some excellent new people in the music department, and, um, and I think we're, uh, we're in the process of, I, I, I think to be honest, there were just some, um, uh, some, some cultural problems that we, we had to address. My, I spent my whole first year on campus because I came in the summer after, uh, after that went down. My whole first year, as I said, we're gonna talk about health before growth. And Scott quoted some of what I said in my inaugural address, which was that year, and I was uh, not shy about saying, we're gonna grow, we're gonna do some big things, but before we do some big things, we need to be a healthy institution. We're not there yet. You, you, you never say, we, we, we declare victory and we can now move on, but um, I think we're in, a, we're in a much healthier place today than we were three years ago, and we're continuing to, to, to be vigilant with, with that kind of focus. Other questions? Yeah, let's go for it. It's not a question, it's a compliment. I'm sitting here I'll take and that. I, Thanks. I want to thank you for valuing <laughs> students. Oh, you're nice. Because throughout your presentation, you mentioned so much regarding them and how you're including them. And I think that what we have to do as senior members of communities as well as adults is start to realize that when they're giving the opportunity to be a part of something, they will play a very significant role. They have been stereotyped mm -hmm. terribly, college mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. And sure, there are parties and things that we see in the news, but in the end, when you begin to value them and, and allow them to have an opportunity to feel like they're a part of something, I think it's amazing. I worked with college students, and when you sit back and really listen and close your mouths, it's amazing mm -hmm. how they will dedicate themselves. So I have to say, I'm new to this, but hearing you today, it's very interesting as well as encouraging to value the kids who attend. So thank you for that. I appreciate your comment. I love our students. I, I really do. And they've been through a lot like we all have. I think uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful. I, by the way, I, I make a distinction between hope and optimism, and I think an optimistic person is somebody who just believes the world is gonna get better on its own and you don't, no, you don't need to do anything about it. A hopeful person is someone who believes the world can get better, but we gotta go after it ourselves. And I'm very hopeful about the future of this world because of this generation of students. And uh, I, I love spending time with them, I really do. I, there's nothing I enjoy more about my job than spending time with our students. And they, are, they have been impacted by the brokenness of this world, and perhaps, no, uh, perhaps not since the, the great generation have we seen a generation of students that have been impacted more by the brokenness of this world. If you think about this generation of students, they were either born just after or before 9-11. The, uh, the Great Recession happened during their you know, middle school, high school years, and then they've had COVID during their college years. And I think this is a generation that just has had this, they've just been beaten, beaten down with the brokenness of this world, and they are not cynical about it. They wanna go after it. And, and again, when we talk about uh, impact-driven students, our students want to, they see the brokenness of this world, and they wanna go after it, and I'm so inspired by that. And um, like I said, I'm pretty hopeful about the future of our country and our world because of the students who are here. I think the other interesting thing is, uh, when I took this job, uh, somebody said to me, oh, you're gonna have such a hard time connecting with these students because this is the digital age and they wanna connect with screens, not people. Um, you know what happened when COVID hit is it was our students who were the first ones raising their hands saying, we gotta be back in person. We gotta be back in person. And this is the, the generation of students that everyone said they're addicted to screens. There was a, a, a famous book out a few years ago called the iGen, uh, talking about this generation as addicted to their iPhones. 
And uh, this generation helped us pivot to technology when we needed to because they knew they were pretty savvy with it. But at the end of the day, it was this generation of students raising their hands first saying, we need human connection. And so I, I love our students. I, I'm grateful for your compliment. But uh, the, our students are amazing. And I think, uh, I think the future of, of our community and our country and our world is in, is in good hands with, with these students. Thank you, President. Thanks Scroll. so much for having Thank me. I'm you. grateful. Thank you for a very uplifting talk today. Thank you. I just want to remind all of you that next month we will be hearing about the history of the Hope Summer Repertory Theater. And we will have the current artistic director, Lenny Manzovitz, and the person who started it, John Tommy. And they will be speaking to us, and I encourage all of you who can and feel comfortable to continue to come in person. It is a wonderful experience to reconnect with people we haven't seen for the past two years or more. And I think it is time we are in a safe environment here. So live stream is wonderful, but come and connect with your house friends and meet our new members. So I will see you here next month, May 5th, for the Hope Summer Repertory History. And I just want to tell you, we have been given till 1045. So we're going to go from 930 to 1045, giving everybody a little more time to ask their questions and learn a little bit more about all the great things that HASP has to offer to all of you. So have a safe and wonderful April, and I'll see you in May. Thank you. <laughs>